I'm very uh, pleased to introduce the first speaker, which is Aris Hagistefanou from Greece. Aris is a very well-known journalist and filmmaker. His regular contributes to the left monthly magazine Unfollow, but is very well known about his documentary films about the democracy, Katastroika, and the new film Francis Inc., which we are going to show after the meeting, nine o'clock in this uh, room. The film is going to be available at the end of the meeting for a contribution for 10 pounds for Solidarity Prize. And um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Aris to come and speak 10 minutes uh, about the Golden Dawn. Uh, hello and uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank, uh, first of all, the organizers for this invitation and all of you that you prefer to be here instead of watching the, the final <laughs> of the World Cup. It's very interesting uh, and we should discuss about that later, that we have Argentina and Germany competing, two countries that uh, in the period between the two great wars, uh, started flirting with fascism and they won managed, the fascists managed to take the power uh, while the, the Peron family in, uh, in Argentina stopped uh, in a level before taking power. Uh, the same thing happened in many other European countries and that should be probably the main question uh, for us today. Which are the conditions under which a fascist movement, a group of fascists, managed to take control, managed to take uh, the power and control a state and continue with in, in the way that we have seen in the 20s and, and 30s. By trying to give an answer to that question, we created a film called Fascism INC. And the first thing that we wanted to do was to make a comparison between the situation in Greece today with the rise of the neo-Nazi party of Golden Dawn and the Weimar Republic of the 30s, which is, I must admit, a very dangerous comparison. And because, especially in Greece, I don't know if the same thing happened here, it was the liberals and... Uh, most probably the neoliberals that wanted to make this comparison. And they wanted to, by using the so-called theory of the two extremes or the horseshoe theory, to explain that, look, if we have two uh, extremes, political extremes, fighting each other in the streets, what will happen after a few years will be to have a Hitler, a Führer in, uh, in power. What they don't want to admit, of course, is that the main comparison that we can make between Greece of uh, 2012, 13 or 14 and the Weimar Republic is the extremism of the political center. The fact that there is a continuity between what we used to characterize political center uh, for the past uh, decades, but suddenly, after the crisis of 2008, 2009, became the most extreme part of the political spectrum. And in order to understand that, we have to understand what fascism really is. And in our opinion, what we were trying to explain uh, to our documentary is that it's just a phase of capitalism. It's, it's capitalism for the hard time of economic crisis. Because if we don't start from that point, we are losing what Bertolt Brecht was saying, that fascism is not a third force between capitalism and socialism or communism, but it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's capitalism when the political elites don't deliver anymore, when they cannot give what they promise to the economic elites, so the economic elites take the decision to play with the most extreme uh, card that they have uh, with them. It's not their best solution. It's not that they sit around the table and say, let's bring fascism forward, because fascism at the end of the day is a massive movement, and so it can become dangerous for them too. So, what, which are the similarities with the Weimar Republic and the, Greece of, uh, and the fascist movement in Greece? We have a kind of what they had in Germany, like the SA, the, the groups controlled by Hitler and other fascists, 
attacking uh, the, the unionists, attacking people who were on strike. It was the same thing like the black shirts in Italy. They were directly promoted and they got money from the biggest industrialists of their time. Uh, let's not forget what happened in the early 20s in Italy where the black shirts of Mussolini uh, were attacking the big strikes in, uh, in Alfa Romeo factory or in Fiat factories and all around Italy. We had the same thing happening in Greece, of course, in a, in a smaller uh, scale. We had the Golden Dawn attacking not only immigrants, which was the scapegoat of this crisis. And even when they were attacking immigrants, it wasn't just a vague, vague idea of racism that it was the force behind this attack. They were attacking the Egyptian fishermen not, because, not only because they came from Egypt, but because they had a, a small conflict with the Greek fishermen. So uh, Golden Dawn was used by uh, some economic powers as an instrument to attack these people. And it, of course, it's not a coincidence that after the immigrants came uh, members of Greek unions and members of the Greek Communist Party who have, still have great power in the, in the Greek ports. So we have seen and we have, uh, we can prove it in a way uh, that uh, big ship owners started supporting financially Golden Dawn in order to crush this, this union. So we have here uh, the first similarity in the first years of the SA and the, the role of the Golden Dawn. The main similarity for me, it's what uh, I characterized as the extremity of the political center. If you see what the two mainstream, the used to be big parties in Greece did uh, for the last five years, it was almost the same thing that uh, people in, were doing in the last years of the Weimar Republic. They created the first concentration camps that they said it was for immigrants. But after a few years, we see that they've started inviting uh, also homeless people for a few days. And now we have the first suggestions from neoliberals that it would be wise to make some uh, concentration camps for unemployed people. And this was an idea that started not in, in Germany of Hitler, but in the Weimar Republic, where they were suggesting, let's bring these people, let's give him some food and shelter, and uh, let's keep, him, keep them safe. That was, that was the main idea. And then we had the concentration camps of Hitler, and then we had uh, the Holocaust for the Jews, the, uh, the homosexuals, and, uh, and the gypsies. The same people, the so-called Socialist Party, uh, even started humiliating HIV-positive uh, patients in Greece. Just before the previous election campaign, they were taking them in front of the camera, saying that this is the problem of our society, just trying to get some votes. For me, that's, that's pure Nazism. That's what they did uh, before the rise of Hitler in power and, and, of course, after the rise of Hitler in power. Another similarity is, of course, the way that the mainstream media supported uh, for many years the rise of neo-Nazism in Greece. If you see what was happening before the murder of, uh, of Pavlos Fisas, the members of Golden Dawn were presented like pop stars in, uh, in, in some of uh, the TV shows uh, that we, we used to see for, for many years. Uh, member, members of Golden Dawn, you had you know, a special feature about uh, some pop singers, and then you had a special feature about a guy who were attacking immigrants, who was killing uh, people in the streets, almost in ident identical terms. And that was, of course, the pulp side of mass media in Greece, because we also had the leading newspapers supporting neo-Nazism in different ways. And they were doing that mainly by uh, what I characterized as the uh, horseshoe theory, by saying that, uh, look, we have the two extremes. The one extreme is the neo-Nazis, and the other is Syriza. 
which of course, as you may know, Syriza is just a moderate left-wing party. But by doing this comparison, the final outcome was that they give the legitimacy that the neo-Nazis wanted. They were presented as just another part of the political spectrum. And in that term, they managed to get uh, the votes and being accepted by many people in, uh, in Greece. We also have the judiciary working for them. If you see what was happening for the last five years, even though we had hundreds of racist attacks in the streets of Athens and other uh, big cities in Athens, there was no single conviction for a, uh, against these uh, attacks of, of the Golden Dawn. It was exactly what was happening the last two or three years of the Weimar Republic, uh, where democracy was practically dead. Uh, there was almost no single decision to be taken by the parliament, but everything uh, was a decision of, uh, of the president of the republic. Something like that happens after the imposition of the so-called memorandum in Greece, the austerity policy in Greece. The parliament practically doesn't exist, doesn't take any decisions. It's, uh, it's the, um, the ministers and the prime ministers who take the decision just with the signature of the president of the republic. So we have, we have to understand this continuation. Democracy is not murdered by the fascists when they come in power. Democracy is already dead and that creates the conditions for the rise of, uh, of fascism. And with these thoughts, I don't know how much, well, I don't have much time. Uh, I have to come to the solution of the problem, which in my opinion has three different uh, levels. The first, if we really believe that fascism is just capitalism with a different face, we have to destroy the conditions that create this fertile ground for fascism. And this is, of course, the economic crisis. And we have to do in the working places in ways that might not seem anti-fascist in, in, you know, when you have the first approach to them. But it's our main goal. Of course, the second level is the ideological battle. We have to go back to our readings and our books and not only understand for ourselves what's the problem during an economic crisis, but promote an idea for the people, something that we forgot to do as uh, leftists in, in the past years in Greece and I'm afraid in other countries. Of course, we should always remember that in this ideological battle, there is always a limit. Fascism, that's, that was a zero time. Uh, fascism, it's not an ideology. It's a political practice. So uh, just by believing that we, we will have uh, a discussion with a fascist and we will persuade him to, to change his, his mind, we don't understand that in the following morning he will come with a different opinion, with something else to say, and probably he could take some of our phrases and some of our rhetoric and use it against us. So there is a limit to that. And the third level, and I will finish with that, is that we should crush fascism in the streets. When I'm talking about crushing uh, fascism, I'm not talking about terrorism. I'm not talking about you know, going with my friends to where they live or where they have their offices and uh, burn them or do something like that. I'm talking about a massive movement of thousands of people that would reclaim the streets where they live. The anti-fascist movement in Greece started doing that. And uh, it was the main reason for which the government uh, had to take these, these guys in prison. There were, of course, many other reasons for that that I don't have uh, any more time to discuss. And by the way, all of my opinions and the people who worked uh, with us are in the documentary. Uh, so 10 minutes, it's not enough, but I'm, uh, I'm sure that you don't care a lot about football and you'll stay to watch the documentary too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, the, the second speaker we have today is Petros Kostantinou from Greece.
is re-elected a councillor in Athens with Andarsia, the anti-capitalist front. He's also coordinator of Kerfa, which is the movement against the racist and fascist force, force, and also he's a leading member of SEC, which is the sister organization of SWP. Petrus is going to speak for 10 minutes as well. Okay. I will start by saying that uh, the Golden Dawn is, uh, is a threat. This is the fascist threat in, in Greece, and it, it is worrying that they managed to, to get from 7% uh, that they got in 2012 to 9.4%. But uh, we have to put this rise in the context of the political situation in Greece. Otherwise, we will be desperate and, or panic. Because uh, what, what it happened in, in Greece the last two years, it's uh, a big shift to the left. So the, uh, the electoral results uh, in the last month in the Euro elections uh, give a very clear picture that uh, the ruling parties uh, felt by almost uh, 30%, 39% uh, really the last uh, uh, four years. And on the other hand, uh, you have... Uh, uh, the rise of the left, the left is, uh, went up to 33% of the population in Greece. So when, when we are speaking about the rise of Golden Dawn, we have to put it on that context, otherwise we are losing the big picture, which is uh, polarization in Greece. Polarization because for the last four or five years we have uh, resistance of the workers' movement, we have the political uh, crisis, and we have thousands of people who shifted to, to the left. And we have, on, on the same time, the fascists coming there and trying to exploit and to win th through this uh, situation. But what really happened is that uh, in, in 2012, they try to, uh, to use their electoral victory of that period, of the 7%, to build squads on the streets and to control the neighborhoods. And this uh, tactic, uh, this uh, strategy of the neo-Nazi party really uh, didn't succeed. They were defeated. And the reality why they were defeated, it's because of the movement. A big anti-fascist movement developed and we really stopped them. We stopped them on the streets, we stopped them whenever they tried to close the shop of the uh, Pakistanis in some working class uh, areas. We stop them when they try to go to the hospitals and say that uh, we want to uh, give blood only for Greeks. We stop them when they were going to the neighborhoods and say we want to collect uh, food only for, and share food only uh, for Greeks. So this was really a big movement that uh, uh, when we came in the last year, when the Golden Dawn tried to go one step forward and to say that we're controlling the neighborhoods, the working class neighborhoods, and we go to um, attack the workers' union in the fishermen area where Aris referred, that was really an escalation of terror. And one week after that, we had the murder of Pavlos Fisas. After this, what happened really in Greek society was uh, a mass mobilization against them of thousands of people. I mean, in two, one, uh, the same day that Pavlos Fisas was murdered, we had uh, a huge demonstration in the area where uh, he was murdered. And one week later, we had the trade unions calling a general strike and a big demo march to their headquarters with tens of, of thousands of, of people. So this uh, forced the government to change their politics they were speaking that uh, Golden Dawn is another political party. They were voted by 400,000 voters. So, uh, so you have to accept them as a political force. And they moved to, uh, to a crackdown against the neo-Nazis. They put the leader, the fear of the uh, neo-Nazis, Nikos Mikhailoglyakos, in prison and some other in, uh, MPs. So they started all this uh, process of... Uh, going for a, for a crackdown uh, for the neo-Nazis. What we are really now in, in the situation that, uh, I mean, they won the vote, but really we can say that the Golden Dawn is not in the advance. What we manage as an anti-fascist movement is uh, not to have the picture of uh, the electoral results in other countries. 
which is, it was not given that Golden Dawn will rise only for 2%. What put the limit against them? It was the, uh, the rise of the anti-fascist movement put a limit uh, there. I mean, the Poles, uh, before the murder of Pavlos Pisas, was showing that they, they could get uh, 17, 18, and 20 percent. So this didn't happen. And for a fascist party, it's very important to advance very quickly. And uh, this really didn't happen because of, of, the, of the mass action of the uh, anti-fascist uh, Movement. So the real question is how how we go on, and uh, we have to to put the task that uh, uh, we will come to the point that they are starting to lose their electoral base, their votes, and this can happen, and it can happen because uh, uh, the anti-fascist movement is there. The anti-fascist movement uh, can uh, uh, put. Uh, on the agenda that uh, the trial for Golden Dawn will happen and we will not avoid to, to go on court and go to, to the prison. Already half of the um, parliamentary group of Golden Dawn ended in prison. I mean, the number two of Golden Dawn just three days before ended in prison. And he was elected again in uh, the Athens municipality. They got 16%, they got four seats there but they ended in, in prison before the uh, starting of the new council that they started on, on the 1st of uh, September. So it's, it's very important to push for this tactic. Uh, this is not to rely on the state and on the judges, but this is to rely on the movement and say that they will not avoid to pay for their crimes. The tactic that we, we are using against them and... Uh, I mean, we manage as an anti-fascist movement to put our own lawyers in the uh, prosecution. And this is very important that this is a way to, to show to the mass of the people the, that they were criminals, that they murdered Pavlos Fisa, Shahzad Lukman, they attacked uh, the fishermen, they made all this dirty job. Uh, it is a tactic to show their relation with the ruling right-wing party, how they, they covered all the attacks uh, and how the police was helping the squads in the neighborhoods and so on. So this is a tactic that they were, uh, were using there. But the, the most important thing is how we move as a, a movement uh, in the streets, in, in the workplaces uh, against them. And there we have to be very clear that uh, this uh, five, uh, 500,000 uh, people who voted for them are not all of them Nazis. There is an Nazi call there, but there is a large part of voters that they voted for them in a period of a political crisis, in a period that uh, uh, the ruling parties uh, who are using austerity and they are spreading poverty, they are falling down. And so the Golden Dawn was able to attract right-wing votes. But in their effort to do this, they made uh, a new choice, and that new choice is to, to pretend that they are not a Nazi party, they are a political party, that they are using the parliament to express the people who are anger against the uh, austerity measures and, and to uh, present the, the, themselves as an uh, alternative. So it's very important to uh, break this uh, picture, to insist that they are a neo-Nazi party, that nobody can uh, support them. This means that we have to engage with the people who are fighting and try to go to the neighborhood to speak to these people, even to, the, to these people door by door, and explain that uh, the Golden Dawn Party is a party of the system. I mean, Iris put some very important remarks how they are uh, having all the relations with the ship owners, uh, with the industrialists, with the capitalists, and so on, that they are part of the problem, they are part of the, of the system, and to build an alternative. It is very important not just to, to fight them on the streets, who are, this is something that we did it in, in Greece very systematically, and the Golden Dawn, they couldn't even have an open rally before the, these elections. That, that was a big success of the movement. We don't uh, let them even to open offices, and now they are closed in their offices, but we have to relate with the workers' movement, with the workers' resistance against the austerity, and to show that there is an alternative. 
a radical alternative, an alternative against uh, capitalism, which against capitalism, which shows that there is hope and not despair. Not you don't have to 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 move to all these uh, demagogues, but the alternative is to go to the left and to go and fight with with the workers' resistance. And part of this is very important to open the fight against racism, because racism was one of the main instruments how Golden Dawn um, managed to, to get uh, uh, all these votes. And it is very important that uh, in, now in Greece, we, we have uh, worker struggles, and the immigrants are part of this. I will give two examples very quick. One is the, a great uh, strike by peasant workers in uh, uh, Laconia, which is in the south of uh, Peloponnese, near Sparta. Uh, 1,000 peasant workers, they went on strike and the, the demands are demands against racism. They want papers. They are against the, the police. They are against the, the mayor. Uh, I mean, they don't leave them even to, to go to the central square. They don't leave them to, to rent houses, to go to, to the barber, to go, to go to the central cafe. So this is apartheid, this is racism. And we have a strike against these uh, attacks. And on the, on, on the same time, we have the trial of the shooters of the peasant workers of uh, Manolada. Oh, this, this happened last year, and it is impressive that these people are standing against the, the bosses, standing against the bosses who didn't uh, pay them, but they shoot them. So it's very important to stand against racism, and uh, I think that we have to combine all this, uh, uh, this struggle. So for the next period, what we are organizing, uh, we are one year after the murder of Pavlos Fisas, so we're moving of, uh, for what we're calling an anti-fascist September. This anti-fascist September uh, means that on 18 and 19 of September, the anniversary of the murder of Pavlos Fisas and the eruption of the movement, we're going to have uh, demonstrations in Athens, demonstrations in the neighborhood where Pavlos Fisas were mur murdered, and uh, the second day, the friends of Pavlos Fisas, who was a musician, they are going to organize a big uh, concert and, and demo in the center uh, of Athens. We are uh, inviting an international meeting on 12th of uh, October in Athens. And this is where we are going to, to speak and to uh, coordinate with movements around Europe in order to organize uh, a new International Day of Action on 21st of March, which we think it's our response to the rise of the neo-Nazis, the fascists, and the uh, racist, uh, populist, uh, far-right in Europe. We continue the battle inside Greece against the neo-Nazis. There is time and there is hope that we can stop them because we are having all this uh, rise of the anti-fascist movement, but we have also to coordinate internationally to, to stop them and to give the possibility to all the movements around Europe to stop them. So the way forward is to fight uh, against the neo-Nazis, bringing all the forces, all the different uh, political forces in a united front against them, to insist that we will not let them to uh, show that uh, now they are not Nazis and they are a political uh, party with no relation to, uh, to fascists, but also we are going to build an international movement of hope, and we can do it. Our third speaker is Wayman Bennett, is a joint secretary of the Unite Against Fascism, the campaign in Britain who stopped the two Nazis of BMP to elect it in the European Parliament, but also who organized hundreds of demonstrations across Britain to stop the EGL. He's also a leading member of Socialist Workers' Party. Wayman is going to speak for 10 minutes. Thank, thank you, comrades. And I really want to start off with that thing that we're actually we're internationalist. And I, I want to start off by thanking both speakers because the service that's been done in Greece is very, very important to us. And I'll tell you why. Because when the reports came in about Golden Dawn, also the reports came in about Jobbik and the reports came in about the Front National. And what was beginning to happen across Europe was what I call the great despair. There's no way of stopping these people. The objective circumstances are driving it, 
and the question of how to stop it, how you begin to build opposition against it, was, was being challenged. That history was simply going to repeat itself as it did inside the 1930s. And the reason why we have to look at, um, uh, we have to look at um, what was going on in Greece, I remember the pictures, the leader, the Führer, of, uh, of the Greek, of the Greek, um, of Golden Dawn, saying that he was going to be the next mayor of, 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 uh, of Athens. And it looked like that possibly could be the, uh, you know, it, 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 could be, it could be the case. I just want to re just reinforce a couple of things about the scale of the crisis there. When you think about PASOK, that used to have, PASOK and New, New Democracy, had the, the main parties of the ruling class had 69% of the vote and it's collapsed down to 30%. In fact, PASOK got 8% of the vote. The great big centre parties, the parties that dominate, collapsed in the wake of the crisis. When you think about the scale of the unemployment that's driving this and ripping apart people's lives, which is the force of the reason why Golden Dawn has been able to uh, push through. And the truth of it is as well, some, one of the factors about the growth of fascism that's important is the idea, the role of the ruling class in its involvement. In fact, I think there was an expose, wasn't there, of, uh, of, the, of the link between um, the Conservative Party and parts of Golden Dawn that had been given them support and that was exposed in part of what came out of the trial. It's not true that you automatically have the growth of fascism. There's actually an interrelationship between the role of the state and parts of the ruling class in terms of being, uh, in, in terms of, of being able to break it. But it, I want to emphasise one thing. Fascism is, it is partly, they don't intend fundamentally changing the society, but it is a fundamental change in the way that bourgeois society works and the way that capitalist society works. The rise of Hitler was to drive, as Trotsky put it, a tank over the back of the organised working class. It was a shift and an attack on that, and actually it's part, that's part of the reason why we have to have a special response to it, because it won't be the same of, of what happened. Because the tragedy of not having a united front, I read the story of the German Communist Party inside, uh, in, 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 inside, um, inside Germany, and the question of the United Front was put forward to them. And I always, when I used to read it, think, well, how could they make this mistake? Of course, we're fortunate. We have seen Auschwitz. We've seen this. But then I read about the general strike of 1930, where the Social Democrats shoot down the workers and then shoot down the left in that sense. The question of having a United Front with them becomes incredibly difficult. I think it would be difficult for us. Imagine in Sheffield they shot down our organisers or anything like that, and then you say we have to join with them. It was a difficult question of the whole question of the United Front, but absolutely it's essential that we do it because I think the question of paralysis, when I went to Greece there was a demonstration in the place where Pavis was murdered. And you, when you saw the demonstration, the heart of the demonstration were Muslim the, uh, the, the Muslim um, organisations that came and participated. And the, part of the argument was, one, to demonstrate that they weren't going to dominate and shape what was going to happen, but also absolutely in terms of attacking the ideas that they put forward in terms of Islamophobia, in terms of migrant workers. That showed the process of building a united front involved both the Social Democrats, involved people who were anti-fascists on that basis, and they were able to challenge and make sure that, 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 um, that, the, that the that the um, fascists weren't able, to, um, weren't able to, to dominate that area. And I think there's a strategy that's been put forward inside Greece with the role that's been put forward that, 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 that's, um, that, 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 that's, that's vital to us. The other part that I want to raise is the whole question of at the heart of that was partly the question of socialism, the left being at the centre of it. I think we have, to, we have to, there was an argument that took place about how to take them on. When I was there, the people said that the people took them on the motorbike gangs first, was the first group of people. I'll be quick. The small motorbike gangs were going to take direct action against them. The question of building a wide united front, of course involving these people, but at the heart of it, how you began to isolate them both politically, it had to be won. And I think that this process is important to all of us when we talk about taking on the Nazis as they attempt to grow and build, um, uh, uh, you know, and try and make serious... Uh, e e um, electoral gains. And if you read one of the other reports is the role of people about how they're trying to make links. Nick Griffin opened an office for Golden Dawn together with them in Kent in order to make links. Part of our international duty is to make sure fascists don't build anywhere. Part of breaking um, b the BMP here was a part of our international duty towards Greek comrades and Greek anti-fascist fighting there to show that they could be broken. 
But, and I think that method has got to be applied in terms of um, in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of today. There's there's a book written by a man called Paxton. He talks about the different layers that fascists go through before they reach uh, a certain point. And he says the first part is building a political movement that can begin to embed itself inside the general society, and breaking that is part of the process that's gone through has gone through in Greece, and I think it's gone through here as well in terms of the work the UAF has done as a method of beginning to break back um, to break back fascists as they try and break through in in uh, in, 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 in European. In, in European countries. There's one other part that I'd like to just quickly add, and I think it's an important part was was brought out in terms of the way that fascists have been trying to build. The food banks, the attempt to try and, and meet people's needs that are trying to uh, break through, the work that they try to do around football clubs, the different methods that had to be applied. In each country, they're using slightly different methods, whatever it is. I think one of the things about assessing people and what they are, it's quite important to look at how they build and organise in terms of working out a way of stopping them. But the, the other thing that I'd, I'd, I'd like to finish off on is that, that one of the things I recognised when I went to Athens was the importance of the organised working class at the centre of the fight. Now, um, people say what difference that makes. The one argument, which I think is a wrong argument, is that if you have struggle, that that will automatically lead to the end of the fascist. I've been told there's been ten general strikes in terms of something which we'd like, and we saw a little flicker of that on the tenth of... Uh, tenth of uh, the, the, the tenth of this month, but at the heart of that, one, the heart of those struggles that took place, there was a unity that pulled the workers, workers together, but that wasn't enough to push Golden Dawn back. You also had to have a political element that said, we have to have the strikes, we have to have the fight, but part of that is raising the questions of other people that are attacked. And the question of politics there is absolutely central in terms of bringing that together. So that's I want to argue that part of looking at the film that Aris has done and part of what Petros has said is that we have to build an international tradition that you centres the United Front at the centre of what we're doing and it's going to be absolutely necessary in the future in terms of shaping what happens in Europe and the rest, in the rest of the world. And that's part of the reason why we've, we've, we've had this film. But I, I think that Golden Dawn still remains a danger, but they're not in the same position they were in before. And it's important that we learn the lessons of how you build a United Front that pushes them back and the lessons and the lessons about how we stopped uh, Nick Griffin, and I'll stop there. Yeah, um, I had a few questions I wanted to ask. Some of them have already been answered, but um, I just there's one question I want to ask about uh, Sarita. Um, I was just listening to uh, Panos this morning um, talking about Cyprus. He is like uh, supported. Jean-Claude uh, Juncker, how is this uh, accepted within Sarita and how come there hasn't been a move to, you know, get rid of Cyprus within Sarita from the more radical elements? Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm living in Poland at the moment and I want to just describe a little bit the situation there when it comes to the extreme right and the, and the fascist movement because what's happened over the last few years is there's been a demoralization amongst anti-fascists because the fascists hit on a very good way to gain popularity. There's a national day on the 11th of November where there's an official kind of government parade and everything and people who are disgusted with the government don't have anything to do. So the fascists started organizing their own parades and gradually they they grew bigger and bigger. They hid themselves amongst the crowd in the past, and now they're kind of leading the, 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 the big march. It's like uh, tens of thousands of people even. Obviously, most of the people on it aren't fascists, but it's given them, it gave them the confidence to organize a new fascist party a couple of years ago. Now, what happened this year, they had their march, and on the way, they tried to attack this squat which, uh, in which there were uh, uh, single mothers and children, among other things, and, and other squatters living. And the squatters defending themselves with petrol bombs and uh, all kinds of weapons. And, and they, they managed to defend themselves from, from fascists attacking from the march. The fascists then went on to burn a rainbow which was made by an artist in central Warsaw, this huge rainbow, and they burnt it down. This was a symbol of, of gays, obviously, so they had to burn it down. 
And the, the reaction to that, with, people reacted very quickly. Um, and in the day, uh, they, there's a counter demonstration to this original parade, which people didn't want to have this year because they were so demoralized. We did have a demonstration. And because we had the demonstration, we had something to build on. And then after the events of the, uh, of the fascist demonstration, when they, the, they, they attacked the squat and burnt down the, the rainbow, we managed to organize a quick demonstration afterwards, in the days afterwards, which was twice as big as the, our original demonstration. And we included students in it for the first time uh, in quite big numbers. And also... Um, a small delegation of trade unionists. And this was all, um, you, you know, this is all on a much, much smaller scale on the situation in Greece. But it's still important to get the orientation. Because really, if you look at fascism, the roots of fascism is, is in the lower middle class. These are people who don't fight like workers. If there's a crisis, workers can strike. You've had, I don't know, 30 whatever plus str general strikes in Greece. The lower middle class can't do this. So if the, if the, if the uh, uh, workers, especially where workers are passive, there's a, you talked about polarization in Greece, where workers are passive, the situation is even worse. So uh, people can look to a radical solution against what's happening against mass unemployment uh, uh, and the rest of it. And I think... Uh, there is a kind of pseudo-revolutionary talk amongst, uh, amongst fascism, uh, fascists as well. They talk about a national revolution, which can be attractive to, to, to some young people who want to fight, who want, who, who want to fight back. And I think that's, that's the even more reason why we have to mobilise amongst, uh, amongst young people and mobilise the trade union get get trade union support to show that there is an alternative to fighting back against a government that everybody hates and knows it's a neoliberal government and so that they don't buy into this pseudo-revolutionary talk. I think that's very important. Hello. As I'm uh, being French, I'm shocked by the rise of French National Front of Marine Le Pen. Marie Le Pen came first at the last European election. She recently joined the Golden Dawn in the European Parliament, and she reached 18% uh, in the last presidential election. This occurred at a time of, as you said, um, sorry, at a time of an economic crisis in France. And the main question is how could we fi fight against fascist parties? Do we, la do we let these fascists express themselves and let them run for election? Or we do, do we dismantle these fascist parties as it was partly done uh, in Greece for the leader? Uh, the main danger is that Marine Le Pen was democratic, uses sorry, democracy as a tool against democracy, uh, like Hitler did when he became chancellor. She gives the impression that she's not fascist, but in fact she takes advantage of people's, um, I would say, uh, people's uh, disgust of no more politics and no more politicians to use that as a tool against democracy. Uh, I think we should unite together and demonstrate together. We have to coordinate this movement and it should be based on the working class because the working class cannot hear the no more politicians in, under economic crisis. They are think that they have the impression that their voice is not being heard anymore. And of course, the fascist parties use us at, take ad, advantage of this. This has been as well a turnout in French politics when the so-called moderate right-wing UMP, when he's asked to make a choice between a left-wing candidate and a national front party, he doesn't even more take side anymore. He said that he goes, it's a, a bit the same thing, and this uh, uh, goes against national front. So I think I will just conclude that we should unite our force all over the world and demonstrate and give an alternative as well to the people who actually aspires to uh, go overcome this economic crisis. Thank you. I, um, I'm Max from uh, the IS in, uh, in the Netherlands, and I think uh, Wayman is, is really right when he says that it's not enough to have economic struggles to fight 
uh, uh, racism. Uh, to give the example of the Netherlands, um, this is this is the argument that's being used by the main uh, left reformist party, the socialist party. They say like. Um, if we if we concentrate on the economic issues of the workers, uh, in the end, uh, we'll show that Geert Wilders and his Freedom Party are not right, and then he will disappear. Well, Geert Wilders has been here now for 10 years, and the problem is that back in the days, he would distance himself from fascist parties. He criticized the Front National. He said, I'll never work with the FPO from Austria. Right now, he's in a coalition with him. His members of parliament in the European Parliament are sitting in the same fraction as Jean-Marie Le Pen. He would never have done this 10 years ago. Um, he does this now. Why? Because no one attacks him. Well, no one from the, from the, from the mainstream or from, from the big parties. And I think it's really uh, important to see that because of this, uh, Geert Wilders is radicalizing because he's not being attacked because there's no political struggle against his racism he's allowed to radicalize and uh, I think this is also a, a very important lesson for uh, for Britain when you you have a party like UKIP oh, uh, just like Geert Wilders they're not, they're not fascist but they can become fascist or they can pave the way like in Greece Laos did. They, they paved the way for a fascist organization. So the struggle against fascism really starts in, in Britain with fighting against UKIP and in the Netherlands with fighting against the Freedom Party. I think it's absolutely necessary to understand this. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was doing a paper sale on Buchanan Street in Glasgow, and a young woman took my picture, uh, she, and she gave me an SDL sticker. Hmm? Guys, waving at me. All right. Uh, right. Sorry. Uh, this is my first contribution to Marxism. All right, give me some slack. <laughs> Right, and she gave an SDL sticker to one of my comrades, and obviously it was a myth to intimidation, you know, we've got your picture, we know what you look like, and we'll, in Scotland, we have a saying that I think would fit with that sort of statement. It said, Mon then! <laughs> we, when they came to Cessnick subway station, a few weeks after that, no, it wasn't the SDL, it was Britain first, even bigger, you know, all five of the SDL. Well, when Britain first came there, they came there in about their 20s. Meanwhile, the SWP, all, well, us, anarchists, the SNP, all had representatives there. If they want a fight, they'll get one. We will fight them on the streets. We'll even fight them on the beaches if they want to go old school. <laughs> we'll stand strong. We'll stand together. And more importantly, we'll stand wherever we want to stand. These are our streets. Everywhere is our country. We are people of the world. We will fight them in France and Greece, wherever they want to fight us, Germany, Austria, pick a place, we'll fight these, moan then. I'd like to point out the differences between 2014 and 2012, uh, because some people say, you look at the election result in 2012, Golden Dawn got 7%, 2014 they got 9%, so the fascists are advancing, why are you talking about an anti-fascist movement? But it, this is very superficial. After the election result in 2012, there was a wave of racist attacks. Golden Dawn were on the rise, they were opening offices in working class areas and using the offices to attack Pakistani immigrants all over Athens, not to speak about the, the other areas in Greece. Now it is different. They got 9%, but what is happening? The offices are shutting down. The wave of racist attacks has gone down. The difference is that in the meantime, in the two years that have 
between 2012 and 2014, there was a wave of anti-fascist mobilizations. Every time Golden Dawn attacked an immigrant in a neighborhood, we would organize uh, a, a demonstration. The, we would make sure that the demonstration was led by the local Pakistani community, that the people who were attacked would be at the forefront, that the unions would support the demonstration, uh, opposing any racist arguments that we cannot have a demonstration because the victim was uh, an illegal immigrant or, or, or whatever. It was through this kind of, of work that the anti-fascist movement was built. And the, the other political aspect was raising the demand that the perpetrators of the attacks must yeah. be arrested by the police and taken to court. Because in every attack, the police were absent. When the, the immigrants tried to go to the police station uh, to lodge a complaint, to demand that the police investigate and uh, find who attacked them, uh, there was complete silence. So we started raising the, the demand that uh, the police are to blame, the police are covering up uh, the Nazis. So uh, the, the Nazi attacks must be investigated and the murderers brought to justice. That's how the, the trial of Golden Dawn came about. It's not an abstract question. Do we use the state? Do we use the courts, bourgeois courts against the fascists? This is an abstract way of posing the question. When a banker steals the money from the bank, what do we say? Oh, we won't use the bourgeois court to, to pursue them. They, they can uh, walk away scot-free. It's the same argument. We can't let Nazi murderers walk uh, scot-free. They've got to be brought to justice, and those who organize the squads must go to jail. It was won. This argument was won within the broader movement, within the left, and this is how the government was forced to start jailing the leading members of Golden Dawn. The, the fact that um, the last leader that was uh, walking free was put in jail th three days ago is a major victory. It means that this campaign has been successful and it's a basis on which we, we, we can continue. The trial of Golden Dawn will probably take place in November in Greece. It will be a stepping stone so that on the 21st of March we can have Europe-wide demonstration with Golden Dawn in jail. My name is Francis Roy from the Irish SWP. Uh, I'll be short and brief. Uh, I would agree with the, the broad sentiments of the the young uh, young lad from uh, young chap from Scotland uh, who made his first contribution, but. I think uh, we can't just uh, just uh, build, you know, a political mo uh, like a, a street fighting movement on the streets. I think when Theresa do come to power, and they will come to power, uh, uh, it, that uh, that when uh, when that happens, uh, it, it'll raise the stakes big time for the left, uh, not just in Athens but around Greece to get involved in the tr uh, to really build build things up in the trade union and within the workplaces. Because the next question I have for uh, the whole the whole panel is, it, will the election uh, of Tespiris as prime minister, whether it's uh, whether he has a democratic left uh, or I was uh, I heard that there was a, a right another right nationalist group uh, that he could go to coalition with, could uh, the election of Tespiris be the next Allende, a modern Allende moment? A modern historical moment for uh, for us as socialists, uh, people trying to fight against fascism. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd better speak really, just so people don't think it's only men that can fight fascism <laughs> on the streets. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Although not hold microphones, apparently. Um, in, uh, I'm from Manchester, Manchester SWP uh, and in, in the UCU, and I've got to say that one of the greatest moments I've had this year was on European election night when Nick Griffin, um, on the way into the election count, looked 
absolutely petrified as the police failed to really defend him against the anti-fascist outside. And we nearly got to him. And you saw the whites in his eyes. He was scared. And his, 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 his uh, uh, you know, uh, bodyguards were also scared. And that was, to be honest, it's only about 40 or 50 of us, you know, most of us, fairly middle-aged um, anti- anti-fascists out there. But when we were um, building the protest outside, it was very interesting. It started off again with a few of us. And then um, a Labour councillor came over and started to talk to us and joined in. And then Green, count- Green candidates came out from the town hall and started to join in. And then there were some Labour councillors who previously had been quite hostile to us. But suddenly they realised, actually, it wasn't a bunch of, I don't know, the unwashed standing on a side. We were respectable and we were representing an anti-fascist force in society. By the end of it, we had even Lib Dems come and stand with us to, uh, to, to, to um, show our, our support, against, uh, support against Griffin. And Griffin got absolutely battered. As soon as he got into the, the account, he conceded. His vote was that small. It was absolutely pathetic. Now, um, a lot of that was down to the work that UAF have done you know, over the last few years. It was certainly down to the work that the UAF done, have done in Manchester. I think you know, we should be congratulated for that, as should you know, everybody in, the, you know, uh, in UAF. Um, but obviously... UKIP uh, are, st- are, still, are still a massive force. We didn't do the you know, stand up to UKIP stuff in Manchester because we had to focus on Griffin. But what we did do, when the UKIPers were walking in and out of the count, we were saying to them, you're racist too. And I tell you what, once we've got Griffin, we're going to get you out. And I think, it's, I think that's really important. And by labelling them racist and by, t- by you know, also talking about Griffin as a fascist, and I think that stops um, UKIP forming an alliance with Golden Dawn on, in, in Europe. And I think that's really, really important. I think we just go on and label them racist and realise they have the potential. They're not a fascist party at the moment, but they do have the, the pot- potential to become a fascist party in the future if we Can you don't label them. And racist now. Thank you. I want to agree with something that the comrade from the Netherlands said and perhaps raise a, a tiny disagreement as well. Um, the question of the links between capitalist reaction and fascism is important to get right. Uh, it's clear. Uh, that UKIP is not a fascist organisation. It doesn't have a street army which seeks to smash all forms of independent organisation and to destroy the workers' movement. That's not the uh, role that uh, UKIP is playing. And it's important not to blur, as he said, the difference between capitalist reaction and fascism. Uh, The worst example of that, of course, is Germany in the 1930s, where the Communist Party blurred all distinction between the fascists and even the social democrats. And that was a disastrous uh, for the uh, whole workers' movement and allowed Hitler to come to power. But it's also important to say that there can be interconnections between the two. That UKIP can provide a breeding ground for fascism and a place where fascism feels stronger. Where it can establish itself and find a way in which it can regroup after the setbacks that it suffered because of the work of Unite Against Fascism. It's also true uh, that uh, UKIP can help create the ground in which vicious racist scapegoating can achieve a wider audience inside society. That's the bit I agree with him about, and it's important to understand that. My tiny disagreement, if I heard him right, which may be my, uh, my fault, is I think he said that the, the, the fight against fascism begins with the fight against UKIP. That I disagree with. The fight against fascism begins with the fight against fascism. And the fight against fascism in Britain, even though the fascists are on the back foot, it's very important that Unite Against Fascism continues. Because we need a specific movement that takes on the fascists in every European country. A movement that is quite clear that we are having a workers' united front against fascism, which draws in all the forces which are threatened by fascism, which includes not just the revolutionaries, but includes the social democrats, includes the trade unionists, includes includes the uh, Immigrant Workers Association. And therefore, in Britain, where at the moment the fascists are very much on the back foot, it's still very important 
to continue to develop and to strengthen the anti-fascist movement. That's why the big United Can Against Fascism conference we had recently was extremely important. There are different sets of struggles that we have to do, drawing on different methods, but both of them have to be taken forward. Thank you, Chair and uh, Madam. My name is Amanullah Khan, and I'm the Chair of Anti-Imperialist Front of Pakistan. The thing is this, it's good to say that they are on the back foot, but in reality, this kind of, I won't say naive thinking, this kind of escapism is not realism. In my humble opinion, anti-Semitism and uh, Islamophobia, they should be equated. One should not be preferred over the other. And under the very thin line and thin veil of imperialism and economic domination, ultimately the rascals and the Rasputins of imperialism, they resort to the weapon of racism. I don't think racism has disappeared from England. No. Because as yet there are so many questions to be answered for the murder of that uh, black uh, young boy who lost his life at, at the bu bu bus stop, you know, St Stephen Lawrence. So I would uh, like to request uh, through your good offices that there ought to be global kind of vigilance, unity, and non-politically and political basis, as I think uh, Comrade put a very, uh, in, very intelligently a point, that in all walks of life, Racism has to be looked at as a bubonic plague, you know, if we cannot take, take it lightly. If a Jew is hunted because he's a Jew, it is intolerable. If a Can Muslim you sum is told up, that he's a Muslim, it is intolerable. And now, for example, what is happening in Burma towards the Muslims? So racism must be defeated for the victory of socialism. I'm very, very thankful to you. Hi, um, my name is Jesper from uh, the Danish uh, IS, uh, uh, IS group. Uh, first of all, I want to, to thank the, the comrades from Greece to, to make the call for the 22 of March uh, Anti-Fascist uh, International Day of Action because it helped us very much to build uh, an anti-fascist group, uh, anti-racist group in, in, in Denmark. And for a long time, it had been like that, that you had to uh, dress in black clothes and be uh, on the autonomous the left to be anti-fascist. But, but that had changed during one year of hard work uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, the 22 of March sh was, was a, a, a broad day where students, uh, unions, uh, children were part of, of being against uh, fascism. And when the fascists tried to, to mobilize in, in Copenhagen, uh, uh, two months two months later, they were kicked out of the of the of the uh, of the city. But so we have, and they were their demonstrations were very small. But we have so in that way, it's it's a, a it's a success. We have an anti-fascist uh, organization, and uh, the, the the fascists are very small. But at the same time, we have a very big problem with racism. The, our the, our UKIP, the Danish People's Party, got 25 percent in the European election. Not all of them who voted for them are racist, uh, mm. uh, but still, they 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 are an expression of people who want national national solutions on the crisis. Danish jobs for Danish workers, Danish welfare for Danish people, and and we need to counter that because even all the way to the left wing, there's no no one putting an inter international perspective as they're saying, uh, immigrants and Danish workers should unite. We have a very, very small voice saying that. And we, want, want, we have to expand that because, or else I think the Nazis will Can have, you up? Will have very, uh, much more easy uh, waters to, to swim in in the future. So we have to counter the, the, the racist uh, ideas also. Thank you. The next speaker is going to be the last speaker. Okay, yeah, I think, well, I absolutely agree with that. And 
a lot of what, well, my, most of what people have said um, tonight, I think it's very clear that there's um, some common questions across Europe that we're all facing when we deal with racist populism, when we deal with, um, you, you know, UKIP in this country, the People's Party, um, stuff like that across uh, Greece and, and the role that that plays, uh, sorry, across Europe and, and the role that it plays in Greece as well as here. And, you know, we talked about the uh, interconnections between, you know, Farage's racist populism and, uh, and you know, the fascism of things like the BNP and Golden Dawn and how they do muddy the water and they do pull, um, pull the whole of politics to the right. I mean, Weyman made the point earlier about who was it that invited Gert Wilders to speak in Britain. It was a UKIP MEP. Um, you know, who was it that invited... Uh, the EDL to march in the black country, it was, uh, a, you know, a UKIP member, uh, you know, originally. And so I think we know that there is, you know, once, but that's when the mask slips, isn't it? That's when it becomes very clear exactly, you know, how this uh, system operates and how they're able to do it. What's a bit harder is to call it out um, when they are using the, the populist side of it, when they are saying, you know, British jobs for British workers, or, you know, why, why, don't, why isn't there a healthcare system? Um, what, you know, why, why do we need um, a privatisation and stuff? And, you know, um, as I say, you know, pulling the whole of the politics to the right, it kind of, you know, and v validating the attacks uh, upon migrants that we've seen, which really um, does characterise Golden Dawn's uh, threat and what, what's been going on there. But um, I want to go back to what the last contributor said about, you know, making this an international thing. I think the march that we had in March and the demonstrations on UN Anti-Racism um, anti Day and the call that went out from Greece to across the, um, across the world, I think it was really inspiring when we did march in London, and it was led by Roma people, and it was led uh, by Polish people, and people that are at the very front of the attacks by uh, UKIP now. And so um, when there is uh, the, the call out for, for the anniversary Can of the murder up, please? We'll do of Pavlos in September, we've got to take that fight. Actually, when, you know, we, we've got to raise that at the UKIPS conference on the 27th. We've got to ensure that that is a mixed and vibrant um, demonstration and, and, and really draw these lines out. But then also, I think we've got to be looking forward and we've got, we've got to be looking at that as a stepping stone to next year's March uh, demonstration. We've got to ensure that that's twice the size of what it was this year and it's got to be even more vibrant and there's got to be more migrant groups on it uh, pushing it forward. Cheers. Thanks. Now, I'm going to ask the speakers to give five minutes each to s sum up, and I'll like ask uh, Aris to come first. Thank you very much. I don't like to be the pessimist of the panel, but I like very much to be the devil's advocate, so I would like to challenge some of the things uh, I've heard. Uh, it was said that it is quite okay that after the elections uh, Golden Dawn got from 7% to 9% because uh, previous polls showed that it could get 15 to 20%, so that was a great victory of the anti-fascist movement. I won't disagree, of course, that it was a great victory of the anti-fascist movement that played a crucial role, but don't forget that even Adolf Hitler was sent to prison uh, in 1923 because the uh, political elites and the economic elites of the time realized that it wasn't the time yet or they were trying to manage without him. And then when the crisis really erupted, they had to play the card of fascism. Uh, what I want to say is that we should always keep in mind the, the role of economic elites uh, and what they want to do. The new democracy, the governing party, had also some political aims uh, to send uh, neo-Nazis in prison to, to protect itself and because they think that they can manage with the crisis, which in my opinion it's not the case. You will see what will happen in the next few, uh, few years when uh, Greece uh, will have to face more serious economic problems. We always have a constructive disagreement with, uh, with Petros. Uh, to if we can characterize the voters of Golden Dawn as fascists, and he says no, I say yes. Of course, I don't have time now to explain why I'm saying yes, but the core of my argument is that fascism is not about swastikas and uh, people marching with uniforms in the streets. If we believe that fascism is a continuation of the economic system of capitalism, then we should also understand that the same people will vote, and I call them fascists in order to, to show 
to showcase this, this continuation. Having said that, I don't believe that we should let them uh, and f forget about them. Being a fascist is not something that you have in your DNA. It's uh, parts of the population that are crushed under the economic crisis and they are trying to find alternatives, especially, as Walter Benjamin was saying, when you have a failure in a revolution. Every fascism is a failed revolution. And in Greece, we've lost many revolutions, I'm afraid, because the Greek left managed to predict the crisis but wasn't there with concrete alternative solutions to, uh, to the population when they were asking for that in the big demonstration of 2011-2012. Uh, when we're going out in other countries, especially in uh, Spain or Portugal, they are saying, why don't we have a golden dawn in Spain, in Ireland or in Portugal, even though we have the Troika, which is the IMF, the, uh, the European Central Bank and the European Commission, we have memorandum, we have the same, almost the same austerity policy. I think the answer comes from uh, data that we received from the European Commission some uh, months ago saying that the average family in the other countries like Spain or Portugal lost uh, around 6 to 8 percent of their purchasing power. In Greece, we've lost 35 percent. In the past four years, we've lost 25 percent of the GDP. And if you ask any historian, he will say that there's no historical precedent of a country being in a peacetime to lose 25 percent. So I'm coming back to what the United States, they say with the phrase, it's the economy stupid. I think, uh, of course, fascism is, is a phenomenon that you need to, to analyze in various different levels. But the main fight should be against the conditions that create the fertile ground uh, for the creation of fascism. Fascism is capitalism, and uh, as you will see in the documentary, and I, I'm, I'm closing again with, with Bertolt Brecht, to criticize fascism without criticizing capitalism is like criticizing a butcher, not because he's slaughtering the animals to bring you the meat, but because he's not cleaning his hand before doing that. Thank you very much. Petrus is going to speak sum up for five minutes. Okay, I think it's uh, very important what the comrade said that uh, it is not automatic when you have the worker struggles that this is the answer to, to the fascists, that uh, you have to, to build an independent strategy and tactic against the, the fascists and, and all the, the lies they are uh, using, I mean, racist uh, lies, and all the tactics that they are using to uh, to control the neighborhoods and, and so on. This is very important, not to to rely in an automatic way that the workers' movement will give the solution. Of course, the workers' movement it is uh, in the final step the solution because it gives the alternative on where we can uh, base all our strategy and how we uh, respond to uh, to the people who are. Uh, suffering in, in the period of, of crisis, but we have not to, um, to rely only on the struggle. So it's very important how you build the anti-fascist movement. So in, in this uh, condition, when we say uh, how we fight against the populist parties and the difference between the populist parties and the fascist party, it's very important to, to draw this, uh, this line. I mean, I, I will give the, the example uh, in, in Greece, in 2008, we launched uh, CARFA movement, the anti-fascist, anti-racist uh, coalition, after a populist party rose. It was Laos in 2008, really, they, they got a lot of uh, votes, but it was very clear that on the same time, a small neo-Nazi party was there, that was Golden Dawn, and it, it was very clear that, that we should uh, ring the bell that uh, there is a fascist threat over there. That meant that uh, you should fight against racism, you should face the populist party, but also you should fight against the fascists. So it was equally important to draw the difference between the two parties, but 
It, it was very important to build an anti-fascist coalition fighting against the neo-Nazis because the, the, the neo-Nazis were there. They were trying to build uh, coalitions with the, the base of Laos party. They built the common committees in the, in the neighborhoods and they, they were starting the attacks against the immigrants. So it was very important on the first uh, hand to uh, try to uh, fight against the, the lies, the racist lies of Laos, but you should, you should mobilize against the neo-Nazis when they formed common groups with the Laos supporters on the street to control the, uh, the street. So I think that uh, this can be a, a more productive picture of how we relate with these uh, parties. It can be very quick, the, the actions of the neo-Nazis. I mean, they can use the, the, uh, the rise of the populist party to build, and you have to be ready. So any um, stop of the anti-fascist struggle can be disastrous in, in, in this uh, period. The other thing I want to address uh, is the questions about the left and uh, in Syriza. I mean, uh, in this uh, period, uh, it is very important to, uh, to see very clearly the, the picture of polarization, to have uh, the, the picture that the neo-Nazis are not in the advance. I mean, uh, yes, uh, uh, in our constructive disagreement with uh, Harris, I'm always saying that uh, they are not uh, Nazis or their supporters and we can win them. This is based uh, that uh, we, we have the, the strategy to, to find against the neo-Nazis. I mean, Pano spoke how we use the trial, how we, we use uh, all the, um, the, the effort to expose the neo-Nazis, that they are a criminal organization, that we cannot tolerate them going in the uh, councils, going in the media, going anywhere. So, we are going to open this uh, uh, fight. But always there is the question which is the um, alternative to them. And the political alternative in, in Greece, there is a discussion that Syriza is the alternative and it is also the alternative to stop uh, uh, the, the neo-Nazis. I mean, uh, of course, thousands of people will vote for Syriza. They are anti-fascist. They, they want to fight against uh, uh, races. But really, the politics of uh, Syriza, when we were coming to Golden Dawn and what uh, they are doing against the, the neo-Nazis, it became a big issue in their parliamentary group when they were discussing if they're going to vote in the parliament for, uh, for pushing the case for the MPs of Golden Dawn uh, to open the, the research. Because in Greece, when you are, you are an MP, you don't go to the court if the parliament doesn't vote uh, the, uh, th this thing. So after this, the court is in investigating in your case. So th there was a, a big fight inside the Syriza. And the reason why uh, the anti-fascists won this is because outside Syriza, in the streets, there was a huge anti-fascist movement pushing for that. There is a discussion that, uh, okay, this is a penalization of political life if you speak uh, against the Golden Dawn and uh, for, the, uh, for putting them in, in prison, which is absolutely wrong. I mean, uh, penalization of political life is what this Golden Dawn is doing. They are killing, they are murdering. So if you don't uh, support that they will go to prison, that means that uh, you are uh, giving them the space to do uh, squad is to, to form against the, uh, the squad. So it's very important that we rely on mass uh, struggle. And we don't rely on institutions. We don't rely on the police. We don't rely uh, that uh, one day a left minister will go there and will uh, stop the, the neo-Nazis from above. That's very crucial as a, an issue. But uh, in this period, it's very important to have united front tactics with uh, Syriza, with the Syriza party, with the Communist Party, with all the activists uh, of the left. This is the real majority that can smash the neo-Nazis. So we are going to push for this uh, united front tactic and on the same time, time to leave open uh, the alternative that, that can come from the workers from below. This can be uh, the alternative solution 
uh, we don't support the left government. We support the workers' control. So workers' control, it is our final uh, strategy, but this uh, passes through a powerful workers' movement and a powerful anti-fascist movement. This is what we are building now. That is why there is hope. That's why it's very important to support the 21st of March, the new International Day of Action, because we want all this hope to go around uh, Europe. And we think that this is our turn. I mean, in the, in the 30s, they managed to win in Germany and in Italy, and especially in, in Germany because the movement was split. The politics of the left were wrong. Now we have the hope that with all this anti-fascist action and with the uh, uh, parties, revolutionaries, like SWP in Britain and SEC, we can do it. It's our chance. The last speaker is Raymond Bennett. I think it's very important that we identify our, our, our enemies. And the reason why I say that is that when you look at what's happened in France, it's a, a salutary warning. And that's the reason when we look at what's happened in Greece, the truth of it is, France, the Front National is a, is a Euro-fascist party, but it's, come, it's got actually come first. The biggest danger is that they're, all the ingredients are there to stop the Front National. It's got the biggest Muslim population, biggest Jewish population. In fact, it's got, I believe it's got the, one of the biggest lefts in Europe. The real question is it hasn't been able to put it together in the form that's necessary in order to break through. That's why we're saying when you look at Greece and you look at Britain as an example of building united fronts, it makes a fundamental difference to what's happening and why we don't want people to despair about the question of being able to stop them. We have a complex movement in Europe. We have racists. Um, we've got groups like the EDL. Um, going on the streets in terms of organising in many countries, in Russia, Poland and various other things. We've got groups that are open fascists, that are Nazis, they're using the insignia. We've got Euro fascists that hide it in suits and boots. We have to look at the different ways that they work together and racist populists to make sure we come up with the right tools in order to break them. And the question is a vital question. The truth of it is, in 1917, in the two red years inside Italy, in Germany, the first group of people that get to lead the question are the left. It's not automatically true that it's the Nazis that get to dominate. The actual left get the first bite of the cherry. And when the others do rise and grow, there was nothing automatic to the question of Hitler being able to be able to, be able to push through. When Golden Dawn or the British National Party cannot get respectability is part of their way of trying to win over parts of the ruling class to give them the kind of platform they need in order to break through. And that's part of breaking up their unity before they get there. It's part of the strategy we build now to make sure that we've got the dominance. Trotsky always said the fascists may grow, but when you look at a pyramid, which side is it growing on and what part do we actually intervene? And the subjective question is vital. I believe that in France, the question of not having an organised revolutionary party at the core of building a united front has made a decisive difference to what's happened inside, uh, what's happened inside France. I'll be honest with you, when I went to France in 1985, I remember being told at a massive French organ it's impossible for Le Pen to come first because this is France and this is the country of revolution. And that actually, that's, when you look at it now, that's not the case. A small river, the subjective element is very important in terms of being able to break the other side. And the subjective element is the question of the strategy taken by revolutionary socialists and also the role that they take with working with other people to the right of them. This is a strategy that will make a difference, both that will be effective in being able to change. And why is it important? I believe the crisis, the, the crisis that we face at the moment is, is created by capitalism. The question of the solution is vital. It is absolutely amazing after the Holocaust that you have the growth of organisations like Mussolini and Hitler. And I think the real question we have to face is that in the 1930s, the tragedy that befell the German revolutionary movement, one of the biggest movements in the world, should not be repeated. Our slogan is never again. But I do believe there's real hope against that, and that lies in the question of what happened in 1917, the question of a socialist revolution that began to challenge and change that, and at the heart of it, that is the question of building a revolutionary party. I'm not ashamed to say that I think we need a core of a revolutionary party to make sure the history doesn't repeat itself, and that's part of what the SWP, that's part of what SEC's trying to do, that's part of what socialists are trying to do across the rest 
you, but it's a vital question of parts connecting that to building a united front and also challenging to change the shape of, of society. And I think that's something which, this, that's what this debate is. Thanks very much for the comments that have discussed this, because I think it's a complex question that's going to carry on. But in terms of shaping what happens, we have to put those methods into place. Golden Dawn have been pushed back by those methods. They haven't been destroyed. Um, the BNP have been pushed back. They haven't been destroyed. We have to use the tools to be able to do that. On the 21st of March, we have our international duty is to join with everybody else. But internationalism begins at home. And that means you support everybody by having demonstrations inside the countries that you are to fight the enemies that are at home. And that involves organizing in the class on, on the, with the migrants, with LGBT groups that are attacked, bringing them together into a fist to talk about challenging and changing our, our societies. We have to do those things in order to make a difference. And I think that's how you change history and we change what's going on. I'm, I'm going to stop. Thank you.